go right ahead. All right. Thanks very much, Desiree. I appreciate it. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, as Desiree said, this is the Shrine software session uh, that we're going to be doing from uh, 1 p.m. to probably shy of 3 p.m. Eastern uh, today. And so again, I'm Mark Cerriello. I'm a project manager here at Harvard Catalyst, and I'm joined by uh, some of my colleagues at Harvard Catalyst, including the Shrine development team. And we've got some uh, panelists here that are going to sort of run through some information about the Shrine software and how it is used to uh, network and allow researchers to execute queries. So this is actually sort of a two-part session. Session part one is introductory material for those who may not be familiar with Shrine or those who may be familiar with Shrine and just sort of want to hear some of these things again or meet other members of the Shrine development team. So we're going to be talking about the genesis of the Shrine network software and its history, a little bit about the architecture and sort of a technical overview and then sort of a run through of the user interfaces and um, some recent feature enhancement. I'd like to introduce our presenters. Uh, between sessions one and two, we've got Doug McFadden, who's the Chief Informatics Officer here at Harvard Catalyst, Bill Simons, Director of Technology and Engineering, also at Harvard Catalyst, and Anupama Maram, uh, the Senior Product Lead here at Harvard Catalyst. Uh, you may have heard from uh, just this morning from Anupama as well, and also from this morning, uh, Griffin Weber, who's Associate Professor of Medicine and Biomedical Informatics at Harvard Medical School, will be in part two. All right. So without saying uh, too, too much more, we'll go into session part one, which again, we'll go but from now until uh, just before two o'clock. And uh, this is our sort of introduction to the Shrine software. And our first presenter is Doug McFadden. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Mark, for the intro. And thank you, uh, everyone who's online. Um, these things can go along and they can get tiring at times, but I'm glad you're still here for the second half of the second day of the conference. So I'm, I'm Doug McFadden. I've been with Harvard Catalyst for 14, 15 years now. Um, and I'm going to just give you a brief background of Shrine. For many of you, this is probably review. Um, but I know that there's some folks out there that may not have the full history. So I'm going to do this relatively quickly so we can move on to the more meaty stuff um, in the latter sessions. All right. and. Unfortunately, hold on. I guess I have to click to advance. All right, cool. So um, uh, in the beginning, um, uh, Isaac Kohani, uh, before we even had our first CTSA award, um, identified Shrine or the concept of Shrine as being uh, an important element of uh, uh, sort of an informatics growth, uh, sort of an outshoot of the I2B2 uh popularity at the time and as a result we built a shrine network within the uh, harvard medical school environment with some of the major hospitals um, and of course this was based upon prior work uh, from uh, the i2b2 folks which of course had a predecessor of our pdr and then spin which i think is the shared pathology something network um, and uh, so, you know, we, we had uh, some foundations to build upon. Um, so um, under Zach's guidance, we created an initial vision. Um, uh, the problem, of course, was investigators only have access to electronic medical rec record data at their own institution. And quite often they needed access to this information from other sites to create a broad enough cohort, validate uh, information, and so on. Um, and so um, the goal that we uh, chose to take here was to implement a system that will allow investors to investigators to access other uh, medical record data quickly uh, and quickly is a key element of this. So um, we built we built Shrine the work, as I mentioned, started even before we got our first CTSA award, um, which is a federated network um, and uh, it allows investigators that each of the original institutions to query all the other institutions data. Uh, and it turns out that we did this in real time to give a, a highly responsive sort of mode of interaction. Um, so um, yes, so re just restating some of the, um, the key objectives here. Um, 
and the key in this statement was in the, our original uh, uh, development of Shrine was that um, institutions were all in. So um, they uh, posted all their electronic medical record data to the I2B2 instance that was networked with Shrine. Investigators could query all of that. It's a federated network. Obviously, the data stays local to each institution, uh, which addressed a number of uh, data security and, and privacy issues. Um, uh, reducing or eliminating the regulatory burden was a key part of this work. And so there's a number of uh, security and, and privacy oriented components built right into Shrine. Um, and this was uh, fundamentally necessary to get the approvals at our original institutions. Um, and I think you've heard some of these referenced before, including the obfuscation uh, method that we implement. Um, and then in the original Shrine network, um, all the institutions were sharing the same risk. So only investigators from participating institutions could uh, query data across the network. And this principle has actually undergone some uh, sort of review lately uh, when we uh, look at some uses of Shrine and um, our sponsors sometimes want other people who are not from participating institutions to um, access the network. So uh, this latter principle, I think, is it has different variations um, uh, in the real world now. So uh, major features, as I mentioned before, uh, we built this as a federated network that had real-time query execution, um, which uh, was, is extremely effective for sort of rapid iteration query refinement. You can run dozens of queries in one afternoon based upon the results of the prior ones and get to a, a result that's meaningful um, in just a few hours. Um, as we all know, I2B2 has a plug and play ontology model, and we do the same thing in Shrine. Um, uh, we use essentially the same ontology, although you hear from Ana Pama this morning, and then a little bit more, I think, from Bill later this afternoon uh, about some of the features we built into a recent extension to the ontology support to uh, make it easier for users to find uh, terms within the multiple millions of terms within um, some of the ontologies today. Um, as I mentioned before, there's built-in security, access controls, and privacy. Um, and of course, we're built on and have strong interoperability with I2B2. So um, just a couple of architecture slides. I think sometimes with technical folks, this really helps to sort of understand exactly what's going on. Um, I'll try not to get too deep into detail because I think Bill is going to be going a little bit more. Um, but here we are. We're a site. And we have, it's hard to read, but we have basically an I2B2 instance with our data in it. Um, so how do we get to a Shrine network? So there must be a, some hub out there that um, someone's installed uh, and uh, is operating. And then they, then you simply install the Shrine adapter, connect it to your I2B2. Um, there's a sort of a layer here of abstraction query term mapping and you are on the Shrine network. So um, try to make it easy, at least for folks with ITV2 already to join a network uh, with a modest effort. Um, so uh, in the federated network, um, I'm gonna just give you a quick example of the way queries get executed. Um, I have the old user interface here, as, a, as we know, there's a new one. I just didn't get, uh, put the new one in time here. So you got a user who's using this interface they select uh, terms from the ontology, they build their query, their query goes out um, into the network, um, and then results come back. In this case, result from one site comes back, it populates your query results um, and, and your previous queries, and then um, over time, um, other sites will come back, and so you'll have a, a, a more complete picture um, if you wait a few minutes and the slow sites come in, um, you know, after that time. Uh, so um, I, I mentioned originally that we built a, a Harvard network um, in 2009. I think it was a year or two after we started developing Shrine. Um, we released it open source and there were a number of other networks that were built. Um, these are the ones that we know of. Um, of course, there um, could be more. Um, if you have built one, it's not on this list, let us know. We'd love to add it to the list. Um, there's, a, there's um, as you can see, um, sort of geographically spread, I think primarily within the United States, um, and then leading up to the, um, 
the ACT network, which of course is our largest network to date with around 50 uh, sites in that network. And you get to see a nice little map of the ACT sites um, all across the US. So, um, so that's a little bit about a background of, uh, you know, how Shrine came into existence. Um, I'm just gonna talk briefly about some of the advances that have happened over the years. Um, several of them were uh, pivotal in making sh Shrine successful, especially when we get to large networks. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we discovered early on in the ACT network, um, a prior model of sort of enabling users to access the network and then monitoring their activity um, had a single data steward component that was watching everybody uh, in a large 50 node network. That doesn't work. Um, so we federated the, the data steward so each site can manage their own users. Um, in the original shrine, we didn't have a, a really an asynchronous response. It waited, waited for all the results from all the sites to come back before it reported uh, to the user. Uh, we fixed that a few years back. And now, um, as you can see by the diagram I mentioned a little while ago, um, uh, the results come back um, and the user sees them as each result returns. Um, we did, have done a lot of work for uh, networks uh, stability and scalability. Uh, one of the key changes we made was we reversed the client server model. So rather than having the hub reach out to sites which were acting as servers, um, the sites in the network um, act as clients and the hub is the server. This involves a little bit of sort of polling activity with queues and things like that, um, but it's uh, very stable and very successful for large scale. Um, at, within the, the ACT uh, grant over the last several years, uh, we worked to both integrate the Shrine user experience uh, and the user interface into um, subsequent workflows that can occur within um, the I2B2 and the local environment. Uh, there were a number of plugins built by Sean and his team, um, and we integrated Shrine with those so that uh, information could flow into those plugins about what the user was interested in. Um, and then, you know, very recently, we, uh, as everyone knows, the, the ontologies are sort of uh, very flexible within the I2B2 environment, unlike, you know, some traditional um, relational database models um, where you have to add, add a new column to add new data. Of course, the star schema makes that relatively easy. And we found that that flexibility was also quite capable uh, and, and helpful for handling uh, some, some rapid new events. I think you heard about it with our ontology uh, working group uh, about the COVID-19 extensions that were put in into the ACT network uh, through the ontology, things that we cycled through these like every week, uh, these changes in a test network environment. And then uh, you've seen a little bit from Anapama already, and you'll see more later this afternoon. We modernized the user interface um, and um, you've seen pictures of it already, but um, uh, we think that this is both um, easier to use for novices, and frankly, I find it easier to use myself, so long as I'm not doing one of those complicated um, temporal queries. Uh, so that really sort of ends my introduction, um, although I, I sort of wanted to uh, indulge for just a second here. If you are thinking about using the Shrine software, and you want to use it in a large network or one that requires high availability. Sort of lessons learned from uh, what we've done for ACT is that you really actually need more than one network. Um, so we have three tiers for ACT. We have the stage network, which is set up um, just for the process for sites joining. It's a place once a site just basically installs all the software, they connect up and then we can see whether queries are running well, whether they've loaded the right data and all that stuff before we promote them to production. This allows the production network to sort of be free of sort of uh, the um, ups and downs of a site joining and them changing their configuration and so on. The production network, of course, is the main network and um, in the ACT uh, world, we were monitoring this on a regular basis, at least weekly, to just keep an eye on whether sites are up or down, whether they're having problems, whether an ETL load did something that was unexpected. Um, and then lastly, we, we also implemented a test network 
Um, this was for testing the release of new software or ontologies into the production network. It was also successfully used as the place where we iterated heavily on the COVID-19 capabilities built into the ontology and, and data updates and so on. So if you are uh, thinking about in implementing a Shrine network, um, uh, I uh, offer the advice here about sort of giving yourselves a little bit of room to do uh, things other than just the production network. Um, and uh, I think with that, I think I am done. Yep, that's it for me. All right, Doug, thank you very much. I hope that for folks who are joining us who are not familiar with Shrine, that that would be a useful sort of overview about the history. And now we'll transition into um, having Bill Simons join us to talk a bit about the architecture. <laughs>